The mystery that comes with death perhaps makes mortuary attendants a mysterious group of professionals that many do not quite understand. Caring for the dead is a calling. It is an intersection between science and art, and it is not everyone's cup of tea, as Chabet Birir now reports on Doctor's Diary. The mystery that comes with death perhaps makes mortuary attendants a mysterious group of professionals that many do not quite understand. It is considered as an intersection between science and art. Caring for the dead is a calling, and it is not a job for everyone. Hey, my name is Catherine Karira Jenga. I'm a mother of two. I'm a, teacher, I'm, a, I'm a teacher by profession, but a mortician by passion. Catherine Jenga believes she was called to the profession after her father died in 2018, and she did not like how he was treated and preserved. Uh, when my dad passed, he was in a certain facility whereby I did not really, I, I did not really like the way they kept him at that particular time. So when we transferred him to KU, the reception we got at KU was very awesome. So I was like, okay, so this job can. Well, Mama Pia can go for it. So I asked one of the ladies and she told me, yes, you can go for training. So I started uh, now using my Google. When I was Googling, it used to give me more teaching. So I went to more teaching and they told me, no, you just go to Nairobi University. They offer the, the course at a certain period of time. So I went to Nairobi University and I got a chance and I went for training for three months. <music> She was an early childhood education teacher for 15 years before she found her passion, serving and caring for the dead. Being a mortician is not only considered to be odd, but is also viewed as a man's job. Catherine is determined to give a good name to her profession, a profession she is deeply passionate about. Because I really wanted to change the perception that people think it's a, a job done by, by men. Whereas where at this particular moment, we have got more than, I think, 50 ladies who are in this job field at, 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 the, at this particular moment. Yes, so I really wanted to change that perception that I was like, what a man can do, a woman can do, can do it better. Her family had a hard time accepting that Catherine was going to be a mortician, but because of her persistence, they eventually started supporting her. At first, they thought I was crazy. <laughs> when I told them, okay, after we buried my dad, I told, I told my mom, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. And he was like, oh, when you are Zimu, Meshiko na nini? <laughs> and I told her, no, see you, Tulienda KU. Assume those people were right there for us. We couldn't have taken that body for burial and handle it the way it was handled. So I think I'm one of the persons who is going to put a positive impact upon the bereaved families. And she told me, why are you not teaching? And teaching came out of me. Even today you tell me to go back to teaching, I can't. I wish I knew there was a, such a course to be trained for before. So she was like, okay, come on, jisikia, nisawa. You can do whatever you feel like doing. Actually, after I enrolled in Chiroma and I told her, okay, I got a letter and they told me to report. She was like, fine, I'll support you in, in whichever way. Nisikuwa, kiniambia ati anataka kufanya hiyo kasi. Nisikuwa, nikimambia usi niambie, enda kivi yako. Lakini usiwe ukitaja hiyo majina hapa kwa sababu mimi staki. Lakini akaniulisa mamu. Siyo kasi inafanyi wana watu. Lakini kama bia saa watu. Kama ameamua hiyo ndiye kasi atafanya, hata mimi nime shamua. Wacha tuwaende. Mbazi haka anza. Lakini tukasema na yeye, tusiwe tukiambia mtu mwingine hapa. Tukae tukiwa tumekimia. At first it was not easy. It was not something so easy. Because death is not something that comes to us so easily. So after giving it uh, some thought and after talking to her for quite some time, and that was her interest, then uh, you know, when someone is interested in doing something, there's no point of stopping them from achieving their goals. And since that was her vision and that was her dream, we had no choice other than to accept it. This is the funeral parlor at the Nairobi Women's Hospital. 
Catherine takes us through the process from when she receives a body to when she hands it to the family for interment. We receive the body from the other side or this side, from those who are from the hospital. We receive them from this side. For the outsiders, we receive them from the other side. We use this, this stretcher, to carry the body from the entry point. Then once we receive the body, we put it here for the family to view and identify. If at all they want the clothing, we give, the, we give it to them. After that, we come with the body to this. These are our slabs where we work on, our working benches. Actually, this is an embalming lab. It is two in one. We, we do autopsies here, that is the postmortems, and the, the embalming, the cannulation and the whatever. So once we use this, we use, it is inseparable. Eh? So we use this, we lift, we put the body here, and then we disinfect the body before any other process. After we undress, we disinfect the body. After we disinfect the body, we leave the body to dry for about five to 10 minutes. Then we set the features, we release the rigor mortis, that is the stiffness of the body, and then we embalm. We use gravity. This is what we embalm with. We use gravity. This one, uh, after we, inc we do the incision on the left thigh, we use this one for embalming. So when we use this, it, you see it is reddish in color. There is an, a powder form we use, it's called eosin. So we use 10% of formalin, and then I mix with this. Because once I embalm, I will replace blood with the formalin, the formaldehyde. So I cannulate the, my body, I, I put it. You see it has a sharp end. Eh? I use this pipe. Eh? This one is the one which is going to transport the formalin from the container to the body. So I support it with this, this, these stones. Eh? to avoid the, the, the force. So it goes gently and slowly. So, because uh, it, it is normally 10% of the formalin that we use. Eh? So I normally climb here. I climb here slowly, this yanguke. This is my formalin, all these are formalin. Eh? So we have plenty, so we don't go short of formalin. So I use my formalin. I've already mixed it with eosin, and it is very harsh to the eyes. So once I use, because the, the slab is tall enough for me, I just remove my cacatin and I pour inside here. So once I pour, the other side I've already arrested. So I will climb down after it is full, eh? and then I unarrest the, 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 the femoral artery to enable the transportation of the formaldehyde to the body. So as I claim, as the, the body is absorbing this, I am massaging the bodies to maintain the lifelike features. Because this one tends to, it can change the color of the body. To avoid that, we try as much as we can to maintain the lifelike features of that loved person. That is it with the embalming. After that, you suture the place where you, you did the incision. We have the thick one. We have this one, which we use for suturing. And you can also opt for this one. Then we have S-shaped needles, the ones that we use for suturing the, the incision. Because we have to suture it to avoid leakage of the, of the formalin, yes. But before you suture, you have to insert a cotton wool. Then you, you suture the body. You wash again that body, you leave it to drain, like, uh, like 30 minutes. After it drains, you now put my, I put my body on my stretcher and I store it to my, to my cold room. If it's a COVID body, we don't embalm, but for the natural cases, I embalm, I disinfect, I drain the body and then I pack it to my cold room. This is strictly for COVID bodies, we don't mix. For COVID bodies, we don't embalm, we don't dress, we don't. We just fumigate them and put them in two body bags, ready for the family to come and pick their loved ones. So this is an oscillator. This one, we use it to cut the head because the head has a very hard skull. So we use an oscillator, it looks like this. So 
I just fix it. So this one, the small one, use it for babies, eh? Or for children. And then the two big ones are for adults. And just make sure it's tight. I use my spanners. Then I connect it to my power, power source. So this one is called an oscillator. So once I connect it to my power, and then that is how it works. So I cut my, my skull. So it opens there the skull of the head. It's like a drill. It's only used on the head, not on the stomach. It's only for the head. Yes, and then you have to make sure it is disinfected before you keep it. So you see it's clean. You have to make sure it is clean because also these things, they get rust. Yes. Then uh, we have some other tools for postmortem, we have bread knife. See your kitchen too. We have bread knife, and we have an autopsy knife. And we have, uh, in case this one is not able to do, we use, we can also use this. When you know nganya make it to butchery, you can also use this. Then we have, uh, we have the forceps, all this, and the scalpel. And uh, we have, this one use them for arresting when the vein is leaking. Or maybe the blood is too much. You arrest using this to avoid the, the bleeding. Then uh, we have also an ahama. Maybe kitu imekataa kutokana kabisa. Unaeza still tumia. Unaeza tumia hii kufungua ndio ifunguke. Because we want to, to know the cause of death. Especially for... RTAs. RTA is road traffic accidents. Maybe somebody is, has had a head injury, want to know exactly what was damaged. Yes. So these are the most commonly used tools okay. in an autopsy, for autopsy or for postmortems. Yes. After postmortem, we leave the body there. We do, there's a process called reconstructing. We have to make sure that that body is back again to, to its normal shape. So we do the embalming. We use the six points, the subclavius and the aorta. The subclavius will supply the formalin to the head and to the upper side of the body. The aorta will supply formalin to the lower parts of the body and the stomach. But the, the organs, we normally put them in a polythene bag and then we soak them in formalin and then we return them back to the stomach, including the brains. After that, we fix the, the head because we cannot return the brains to the, to the head because yaku was an anini. So we just put in uh, cotton wool in the, in the head and then we suture the same tool. Then we pack the brains and the other organs into the stomach, back to the stomach and then we suture. And then we leave that body to dry for, a, on, uh, for overnight or a day and then we put it in there cold room. For example, if t the body is leaving tomorrow, I'm supposed to remove that body today. I wait for it to thaw. At around 3, 4, I dress now my, my body. I, I wash my body again and I dress it. Yes. After that, there is paperwork. I have to ensure that they have cleared from, if they were from the hospital, they have to clear from there and they have the proper documents for dispatch. They have the burial permit, they have uh, filled my dispatch form. And then I put my body on that table on the reception. That is where I put my coffin. And then I transfer, after I dressed, I've dressed my body, I've groomed my body, I put it in the, in the coffin for the following day for the relatives to come and pick their loved one. At the family's request, Catherine also applies makeup to the dead. She can also go as far as removing nail polish or unbraiding the corpse's hair. There is a family that can say we want our our loved ones to be applied on makeups and whatever, we also do that. And we have a variety of makeup sets here. We have like uh, ponds, 
We have uh, glycerin. We normally use even this baby care. We have lipsticks. We have ponds. Come on, attack our embeshwa kabisa. We just do that. Come on, if they want the cutex to be removed, we also do that. Yeah. If they want shaving, we also shave. If they want uh, unbraiding, we also unbraid. It is believed that most morticians work under the influence of alcohol and other substances to prevent them from feeling the emotions of constantly seeing and dealing with the dead. Something Catherine says is not true. People might think that you you're working abnormally. There's the use of yeah, the use of substances. We are that is not the case. There was another brother of mine who was so negative about it and he was like, wait, wait, utaku kikunyo bang you come like no. I've visited Chinoma several times and I've found people there, they are working and they are very, very normal. So I'm the person to bring change in our country. Just like in any other job, Catherine has faced challenges from time to time in her line of duty. But she says that these challenges have only made her stronger and more humble. Now that we have the COVID thing, it's really even scaring to us the way we do that body handling. But we thank God at least for the for the frequency of workshops that we've attended with NASCOP, Kenyatta, Kenyatta National Hospital, and uh, the pathologists at large in our country. They've really, really helped us to, to go for Zoom workshops, and they taught us a lot about how to handle COVID bodies. Okay, challenges in your maybe to summarize that my experience need denial from the relatives not believing that their loved person has gone. Now, to make those people accept the situation, you really need to talk to them a lot in a positive manner. So the only time they, we face difficulties is that time of denial. Yes, but at the end of the day, the time when the body is here, by the time when Akuja Kuchukua at least wako, you feel that they are, they, okay, even if it's not 100%, at least 50-50 they have accepted the way situation is. But still, it is a process. It's a healing process. So when they deny, you just encourage them to, to view the body so that the healing begins from here. The farewell home. Feeling begins from here. Yes, so you have to, at least in Dionawambia, we have to maintain the lifelike features of that person. Because the last picture matters a lot. Actually, let me say, in one way or another, it has made me even come closer to God than before because I always take every day as a gift, because I'm not exceptional. When I report to work and I found bodies waiting for me to offer services to them or to treat them, I always say that this is, life is worth a living and it's a gift. So it, had made, it has made me come closer to God than before, and it has made me humble, to, to be humble. Mama kuna mahali we may separate vizuri na hii, this one will help, eh? Itagonga tu hivi. Catherine says that nothing will make her change her career. This is where she belongs and she is here to stay. How, do you know how many people I preach to in a day? Do you know how many people I give hope in a day? Do you know how many families I comfort in a day? That is what I love doing most. Seeing them smile again, seeing them, okay, at least they feel, at least our person was kept nicely. And the, the comments I get from them, it really makes me feel have the morale of coming to work every day. If I knew there was such a career, I wouldn't have gone for teaching. I would have gone for this. Because this is what I love doing most, serving the dead with respect and dignity and seeing their family happy and consoling the family. End of life service caregiving is my passion. Mm -hmm.